Go with this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me. Is this fine or I can not else? Yeah. Could we get started? Yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, I, I, I guess uh, how many people are there in the room and uh, how are the things? Mm. 15. Yeah. All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Biplo Srivastava. And uh, we, this morning, we are going to discuss how can we have AI, artificial intelligence, that we can trust. And it's actually funny that we even should be talking about what does uh, trust mean and so on. We don't talk about uh, bicycle we can trust or cars we can trust and so on. But this is gaining a lot of importance. So I, along with uh, our uh, small group at the AI Institute, which we call AI for Society, will be presenting this today. And uh, joining us are uh, Kaushik uh, Lakaraju. He's a graduate student. Uh, Lik Likita, uh, who is also a graduate student, and uh, Ray, uh, who is an undergraduate student, uh, working with, starting to work with us this summer. Okay, so you'll see some very exciting work. I'm going to the next slide. Uh, our objective is that we want you to make uh, make you aware of the trust issues around AI. Okay, and that doesn't mean to scare people away. It just means that you should use the technology in an informed way, just like. If you are starting to learn to drive, it's not that uh, people tell you don't drive or don't use the cars, but you know how the car works, what are the issues with the car, and how to fix it. Okay, so think about that as an analogy. So our plan is we will be talking about uh, trust issues in chatbots, which is a form of AI, and then in the second session we'll be talking about bias in the AI systems and what can be done with that. Okay. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Okay, so next slide. So as I just mentioned, here is the roadmap for the uh, for today's morning session. And uh, we will start with understanding what is AI from, uh, from a context in which we can start seeing issues. And uh, you have heard about chatbots and uh, the things that they can do. We will give you a sense of uh, the problems are closer than you think, okay? It's just that we need to observe and then what we can do about that. Uh, so that's the thing. So next slide. I think much of the wisdom of the world can be followed just by looking at cartoons. This is our favorite one. And notice uh, the first one, uh, both of them are from 2016, okay? So I'll give you a moment just to read the first one and then the bottom one. Okay, so what does this tell you? It tells you that people, even after they graduate from college, they still stay like students. Okay, they, if they get an opportunity to slack off, they will slack off. And here we have uh, Wally who tries to put chatbot, which can automate it, automatically give the answers. And the pointy haired person is the boss. Okay, and uh, he realizes after a while that. Uh, hey, I'm getting nonsensical results, okay? So essentially what uh, you would actually hope to do with your professor in class, right? The same thing, uh, someone is trying at their workplace. Okay, how is this possible? So next slide. Uh, we want to start by telling you uh, what exactly is the chatbot and how do, do these uh, systems, uh, what changes with it uh, in contrast to your uh, typical software systems so that you can appreciate the issues first. So next slide. If you have to understand what people do in programming, what they actually write a piece of code which can read an input and produce an output. Okay, So that's your standard software systems that you have. Maybe the system which you have for grades uh, uh, in, in school, right? And uh, your parents get informed and so on. So what changes with AI is that they are no longer systems where you give the input and get the output, but they work in an environment. So the software interacts with the, in, senses the environment and acts on the environment, okay? And 
So they just continuously work with the environment and they make some decisions and uh, the, they act on the environment. Now to know that what it is doing, they need to have some reference data. So for example, Google map, when you look at it and it's telling you not turn left, not turn right and so on. So it is knowing that its aim is to take you to the airport from your office or home and it is continuously acting in that cycle. So the moment you go into a loop and you're using a reference data, but the software itself is trying to figure out what action to take, that's an example of an intelligent system or an adaptive software system. So chatbots are an example of adaptive software systems and who know what they are doing by the reference data that is given to them. Okay, so you're telling the Google map, I want to go to the airport, that's the reference data. It will stop only when you have reached the airport, not before that, okay? And it is continuously deciding you're on the left turn, maybe you have, uh, your car has stopped for a while and so on. So it knows how to pick up and take it from you from there. So this is a very key insight about what is a traditional software system and what is an adaptive or intelligent software system. If there is any question, please feel free to ask at this moment. Yeah, there are no questions from the audience. So let's move on to the next slide. So artificial intelligence, you can understand in many, many different ways. One of them is by the goal someone is trying to pursue. For example, you're trying to build an intelligent system. That's one aim. And I want to build Google map. I want to build uh, something which can tell me about which courses to take. So those are all intelligent systems. Another aim in AI is just to understand human brain. And that is neuroscience, cognitive science. That's another aim. Third aim could be just mimicking human behavior. You think your dog is very smart and you tell it many of the things which you think a smart someone else should be doing. So it's mimicking a behavior, okay? That's it. Another way is to think of this as a data science. So there are multiple paths to achieve intelligence and that uh, is uh, the way uh, people consider it. What we will be doing in this morning, we'll be thinking about building intelligence useful systems. Okay. Now, when you look at of, of, away from the goal by methods that they are being used, there are methods like learning, reasoning, representation, and, and so on. And I, it's, a, it's a, too much to explain each one of them, but you will see the sense of uh, this throughout the week. So I'm sure you are getting a sense of it. Uh, but uh, if you have to put everything together, this is a quick summary of the world of AI. You can think of them by goals. You can think of them by, by uh, disciplines. And uh, any useful system has a, a piece of everything. Okay. So next slide. You can think of chatbots is really is the history of AI. So AI itself... Uh, uh, started with a um, lot of activity in the 40s and 50s. And uh, Alan Turing, if uh, you may know, uh, and on his name is the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, almost the Nobel Prize of uh, Computer Science is uh, defined, which is called the Turing Award. Uh, he defined what is called the Turing Test. So if you are in a room and you are interacting with either a computer or a person in another room, can you make out which one is a computer and which one is a human? If you can't, then the computer has to be as intelligent as the human. Okay, so that was the basics of the Turing test. Good or bad, that was considered a landmark. And uh, uh, so that is the start of the AI. Then we have had uh, Eliza, uh, which was uh, in the 60s, uh, a very simple software which could have long conversation with people. Okay, and it was both interesting and sad that people can be duped so easily because it was just using simple psychological cues. It would ask, tell me more, right? You will say, I'm, uh, it, a typical session would be, how was your day? And you will say some things and then it will say, okay, tell me more. So just being a patient listener, which takes up certain points from your conversation and 
it continues the conversation. So it was considered a psychotherapist, okay, in the 60s, but using very little skills. And that was really astounding because human behavior, we just get very easily impressed by others. Okay. And then you would have heard about uh, computers beating people in chess, in quiz show. Um, Ivan Watson was a quiz show. And uh, we all have uh, various devices like Alexa, Echo, and Siri on our phones or home devices. So you can look around and whenever you're considering chatbots, you're pretty much looking at uh, AI all around us. Any question or any concern here? Any questions? Uh, nothing. Okay, you can- So next slide. So there are a number of terms which are used. And when we say chatbots, it's a, actually what we technically mean is a collaborative assistant. We re are referring to a software, hardware, or a combination of system, which is working cooperatively with a person in context to being an adversary. So for example, we are not talking about a chess player working, playing with you. That's an adversary. We are talking about a chess player helping you win matches. So it's a collaborative assistant for decision support. There are a number of terms which are used like uh, conversation agents, chatbots, digital systems, virtual agents, and so on. And we are referring to all of them. So you can think of this as a system which works with a single user or multiple. So there can be a, I could potentially be a chatbot talking to the whole bunch of people in the room. So it can be one person or multiple. It can be any modality right? It can be speech, text, combination. There can be no data sources. For example, it's just doing chit chat or it's a static one, like it's telling you state capital and, uh, and, and uh, states, or it can be dynamic, like weather, what's your blood pressure, how's your health, those kind of things. And uh, we can go on with the classification, but uh, so this is what we are dealing with. So such systems, such AI systems, they are actually handling a lot of uncertainties. One is of a natural language. So you might be speaking in English, you might be speaking in French, Spanish, Swahili, whatever your favorite language is. You can be dealing with different human behavior. Children ask questions in a different way. Uh, parents start asking in a different way. People with cognitive disabilities ask in a different way. There is no perfect way. So uncertainties of human language and human behavior and the third thing is the task at hand. What are you trying to achieve? Okay. So those are the three uncertainties which these systems are handling. So next slide. Chatbots, and I'm sure you have heard about ChatGPT this week. They have a lot of potential because they can actually help you in interact in, in, in various ways. So the three three uh, best ways that people use them. One is to find finding information, retrieving information. Okay, very much like a Google search. Get me what is the state capital. Tell me what is my grade, right? That kind of thing. Second can be in helping in a decision making. Okay, so you might have three ways of going to the airport and you say which one is the best way. So that's a decision support. And the third one could be as a collaboration or mediation. For example, if there are three people I'm considering and I want to ask, what is the best candidate? And if there are three people interviewing and deciding one person, then they might be asking, did, you, did all of them ask an equal number of questions? Was there one person hogging all the discussion? So they can be used for mediation. So these are the three major ways that chatbots are being used. Okay. And I hope these points are getting clear. Otherwise, we can take an example and uh, look deeper into any one of them. For this session, we'll start with only, and we'll stay with retrieving information for most part, but I just wanted you to be aware of the three broad ways that chatbots are used. Retrieving information, decision-making, and helping with collaboration. Okay, next slide. All right, so we keep talking about chatbots and uh, all kinds of things ChatGPT is doing. But the real question is, are we doing anything meaningful? Okay, is 
life is not about just uh, looking at finding what the next best movie is, what is uh, we are doing, what best food is, right? It is about tackling problems around us. Are we able to give safe water to someone? Can we ensure that people are healthy? And if you look around, when we make such decisions, our information is very uh, bad, very poor. How many in, the, in this room know about Flint, Michigan? Is there anyone who knows about what I'm referring to? Yeah, like three or four people raised their hand. Yeah. So uh, what does it refer to? Uh, does anyone want to just mention what it is? Sorry, the water? Uh, the, oh, they're saying the water is really bad. The tap water was bad. And that was because of uh, uh, the piping. The, the pipes, they, they got old. Okay. So what did uh, the authorities do? Okay, people have no information. So they put up a website as is being shown here on the left-hand side, which is advice to Flint residents. You cannot drink this water, but you can take a bath. Okay, that's one advice, but it is after something has gone wrong. You might have gone to a lake and you might have seen, please don't uh, swim here. Okay, and, and such kind of things. So today, if you look around, all these information, they are static, right? They happen after the fact or they are, no, you can find pizza right close by. You can find movie information much better than you can find about water information, okay? And isn't that sad that for things which matter, which are matter of life and death, it's, it's uh, not good to, it's not easy to find information, but for things which are recreational, right? It's much easier. And that's just the way the world works, which is okay, but we should try to make uh, our tools, our things that we learn more helpful to the society and more useful. Okay, so that's what our group does, AI for Society. So let's go to the next slide. So in this situation, what we are hoping is we can build chatbots, which will change the situation rather than going for static, non-interactive, non-contextual, information like is this water safe for drinking what we can do is we can have dynamic information interactive contextual okay so if it is flint you can say yes don't drink this but that water has been improved now right so we should not be considering it based on five-year-old data columbia water might be okay so can we take the information and can give more pointed correct answer. This will not only save people's money, right? Everyone cannot afford tap water. Uh, sorry, cannot afford packaged water. Okay. And it's bad for environment. You are having plastic bottles. Okay. So can we provide information in a better way, in a much more dynamic way so that uh, everyone uh, improves and there is lesser wastage? Okay. So I hope the potential of uh, chatbots becomes clear in solving real problems around us. Any question at this stage? Uh, no, no questions okay. from the audience. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, we actually built one uh, chatbot which can tell you about water information for Flint. Okay, so if uh, uh, Kaushik, you can go to that link out there and you can just play that for a, for a second for me. Water Advisor is a chat-based tool for exploring large amounts of water quality data using machine learning techniques. Here we see a map of the United States. The blue dots indicate locations. Are you all able to hear it or? Or I can. Uh... Uh, so people can hear it or no? It's where the current prototype has data. It's Flint, good. Michigan, yeah. and New York State. First, let's investigate Flint. Let's look at Flint, Michigan. Now we can take a closer look at the data for Flint. I'm interested in drinking water quality. So I'll ask, where is it safe to drink? 
The map is now color coded based on drinking water quality. Red locations are unsafe and green locations are safe. On the left, we also see regulations that bear on water quality. We can click on the dots to get more detail. Koshik, if you can pause here. We see detail for yeah. seven. All right. So I want to just show you a few things here. This is a chatbot which has three interfaces. There is a chat interface on the right, uh, a map interface in the middle, so that you get a sense of space and time. And then on the left-hand side is an explanation interface. So the simplest questions in, in technology are the hardest questions to ask. Is it safe to drink? That question, there are about 45 parameters which tell you about uh, drinking water quality, okay? And only lead and copper were problematic, not others, okay? But how do you answer or reason, can I drink this water, yes or no? And that becomes a very hard problem. And then once you're showing this, if you're giving an explanation, so you're showing this quality of water based on the regulations you have, they are safe or not, right? They are within the permissible limit or not. So that is, this is in the direction of the vision I was laying it out. So I think we can go back to this slides, Kaushik, but, and people, uh, please feel free to try out this video later. Okay. So we have, our group has uh, built chatbots across multiple areas uh, and, and award, gotten awards in uh, many of them. Okay. And uh, you can take a peek at this, but uh, we will keep it very simple and uh, talk about uh, one or two simple uh, chatbots in the rest of the session. But I wanted to give you a glimpse at what we have done. So next slide. Okay, so you have building chatbots, you are using them, then what's the problem? Okay, next slide. So with any system, you have people of different backgrounds working with that system. Think about cars. Okay, you are Henry Ford, you have just built a car, okay, and you're putting it out for people. Men and women are driving it, children want to drive it, elderly want to drive it, people with kids want to drive it. Then what do you do? Is the car okay for everyone to work, right, to drive? And the answer is probably no. You want to educate people, tell them where the accelerator is. They should not be hitting each other, right? Uh, babies need uh, certain seats and so on. So that's where when the technology and people come together, the, the issue of trust comes to. Can people of different background use these systems? Can they get uh, consistent behavior? Does it respect human values? That may seem very difficult, but think about cars which will just explode. Okay. They explode, <laughs> and, and believe me, when the cars were got introduced, there were a number of technologies which were uh, I mean, exploding and they were causing harm. It took a lot of time to get reliable cars. Many of you are thinking about Alive at 25 program, right? How many in the class, uh, they have taken that Alive at 25? Around five people. Okay, so does anyone want to tell what Alive at 25 is? Oh, did you? It's about learning uh, to the driving, right? It's it's a it's an educational program on driving practices and uh, laws. Okay, so the same thing. If you have technology working with people, why should chatbots be any different? So that's where we are getting to. So next slide. Think of a chatbot, which is just telling you train information, okay? And this is a chatbot which we built, and you are asking, is this train on time? So do you say, is the New York train on time? In this system, you have to say the train number one, two, three, one, two, is it on time, okay? But that's not the way we converse, okay? We say is the New York train on time. Now there might be three New York trains, okay, or flights. So 
The other one is if three people are asking the same question, right? The system might know this and it might actually come up with a dynamic pricing. And people who have booked flights, they know that when uh, near, near Thanksgiving and all, the price of the tickets increases, okay? If that happens, and that happens because you're querying for some thing, not many people will consider this as a fair uh, practice, okay? So you're leaking information. What if the chatbot is, uh, is abusive, okay? It gives you foul words. That is possible. So these are not the kind of things which you would expect from technology. So this is what we mean by trust. It should be safe for people of different backgrounds to be using it. Okay, so next slide. In the, uh, there are many kind of issues which can come, but the ones which we have highlighted are leaking information, abusive language, bias, which means that it may answer for some people, may not answer for some people, okay? Uh, and complex response. It may give in a way that is uh, inconsistent or not understandable, okay? So there are a number of things which we have handled, and uh, I just wanted to give you a peek of that. So now I think it's time for Ray to take over and really get hands-on with uh, these. Uh, just one previous slide. There, are, uh, there is an illustration of how these different things show up in conversation, okay? And so these issues are really real. It's not about trains, but there can be in any domain where chatbots are built. So the trust issues are there. But I will let uh, Ray come over and talk about a uh, very simple uh, situation and you would be amazed what kind of issues can come. So Ray, over to you. And before that, if there are any question about the morning session or whatever I talked about, please feel free to ask right now. Okay, so Ray, over to you. Uh, yeah, we're just um, setting up something. Yeah, and share your screen if you want. I'll just stop sharing it. You're yeah. on the call, right? Yes, I so am. You can use this for audio and video, and you can oh. just share your screen. No, it actually kicked me out. Um, is that fine? Or you can take like two minutes. It's fine. Okay. Um, Not just you can take care. Of just make sure you mute. Yeah, you're in. Recording in progress. Oh, share screen. <clears throat> All right, we're good, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so my name is Ray. I am currently an undergraduate student at the University of South Carolina, <clears throat> and my major is computer science. Uh, so right now I'm working with the AI Institute for my summer research project, which is fairness testing in chatbots, uh, which is what I want to talk about today. There we go. Um, so the main thing I'm looking for when I'm testing fairness in chatbots is instances of bias. Um, and he covered that just a little bit um, in the previous slides, but bias is just kind of um, giving something that does not reflect what's actually happening, um, especially if it discriminates towards a certain group of people. Um, and the reason that bias happens is because so many systems have bias source material that they pull from. So if at your very, very base, the data that your system is kind of pulling from has issues with being biased, then um, for example, in a chat bot, when it gives a response to somebody, the response that it gives will kind of reflect that bias. Um, that bias will kind of ricochet around um, and then get spit out to the user. Even if it's not intentional, bias source material is very common because humans themselves are biased. Um, and that's what makes it really hard to evaluate because when humans are biased and they're the reason why bias source material exists, but then they also have to evaluate for bias, you can run into a lot of issues. So what I'm doing this summer is just fairness testing 
where I'm just evaluating systems for how much bias that they have. And you can see here is kind of an iceberg chart of uh, where bias comes from. Um, and you know, when it spits it out to you as a user, it's kind of just the tip of what's going on underneath the surface. So my mission this summer um, to start out at the very beginning was to create a system that was as free from bias as possible. So I wanted to kind of think of a topic that was extremely concrete. Um, and I couldn't think of anything better than a state capital chatbot. Um, because when you think state capitals, you don't think of people arguing. There's only one answer. So if it were to tell you, oh, what's the capital of Alabama? And it tells you, oh, the capital of Alabama is Georgia. That's just wrong. There's no way to argue against it. There's no way to kind of maybe think about it or give it some wiggle room, um, which is why it makes for a very good model for kind of creating something that gives a predictable response every time. So I'm just gonna do a small demonstration of how this chatbot works. So does anybody have a favorite state? Texas. Texas, okay. What do you think the capital of Texas is? Okay, okay. Um, so we'll ask it, we'll be nice. We'll say, we'll say that we're good. Um, and then we'll ask, what is the capital of Texas? The capital of Texas is apparently Austin. I didn't know that either, but here. Does anybody else have a favorite state that they wanna ask about? No, no love for South Carolina. Y'all are literally here. Okay, uh, Hawaii, okay. Honolulu, okay. And just because it's one we all know, I'll ask about South Carolina. There we go, South Carolina is, got a capital of Columbia. Um, thank you all for participating. I'll let everybody pass out while you talk among yourselves. I appreciate it. Um, so here you can see kind of the responses that it's giving. It's giving the same exact type of thing every time, um, which can get kind of boring, but there's no bias possible happening here. I mean, it gives you exactly what you want to know and no more and no less. And this is kind of different from what you would get if you were talking to a different system with maybe a bigger database like ChatGPT or something else. So, So here, um, I created my chatbot using a framework called Rasa. And Rasa is really, really good for creating chatbots for kind of niche categories, um, but it does have some limitations. So this is just kind of a diagram of how it works, which I know looks a little bit weird, but there are really only three components to this. Um, in order for a chatbot to work, it needs to know what the user wants. And once it figures that out, it needs to know what to say back. So, this user intent here is just it figuring out what the user is wanting to know. So for example, the capital of Alabama, these are all of the phrases that it will recognize and say to itself, oh, they wanna know the capital of Alabama. And so then when they recognize that a user has asked them for the capital of Alabama, it reads that in as the intent. And then I have made a rule that says every time somebody wants to know about the capital of Alabama, you should give them the capital of Alabama, which is just here. So every time you ask about the capital of Alabama, it will give the same exact response every time, which is what makes it so nice and predictable for us. Um, and here again, you can see, this is exactly the data that's put into it. And that's pretty much exactly what you get. Um, there aren't any really surprises or anything like that. And that makes Rasa and how it works kind of ideal for controlling and limiting bias within a system because exactly what you put in is exactly what it's gonna put out. So if you put in something horribly biased, it would also come out horribly biased, but I think we're safe with the state capitals. At least you would think. So in my research, I wanted to compare at a very base level, something really simple 
um, to kind of go head to head between these two types of systems. Um, chat GPT, which is a lot more widely used and widely recognized and a system that's a little bit more niche but a lot more controllable like Rasa. So in this head to head, there's a lot of things to think about. So Rasa is great because most of the time, especially in my case, it has a lot smaller of a database, but it means that that data is a lot easier to control and kind of manipulate to make sure that it's giving the same response to everybody. And when you, if you do see bias in the system, Rasa's files are completely open. You can just go look at them. Um, so most of the time, somebody's Rasa chatbot, probably on GitHub, you can go look at their data. You can see exactly where it's pulling from and kind of pinpoint where that bias is showing up. Then, but it also has a lot of weaknesses. So because you can control it so well and the database is a lot smaller for the most part, um, the flexibility in kind of recognizing what the user wants is limited. So what I showed you a minute ago where it had a list of like sentences and phrases that it recognizes, that's all it knows. It's not gonna like interpret on that or like expand. And if you say something that means the same way, that means the same thing, but you say it in a very different way, it's not gonna get it. So when you're using a Rasa system, the user burden is a lot higher than it would be with something like ChatGPT because you do kind of have to know what you're getting into and kind of know how you're supposed to ask things. And not to a huge extent, but it's not really as flexible as some larger system is. And the other thing about it is, it is kind of difficult because the database is small for it to take in those follow-up questions. So for example, if you were to ask the chatbot that I just showed you, if you were to ask it, hey, what's the capital of North Carolina? It says, great, the capital of North Carolina is Raleigh. And then you say, cool, I have a date, where should we eat? It does not know that. <laughs> it's not gonna be able to answer that for you. So it's going to give you exactly what you put in. And again, no more, which is good, but also bad. Um, and then in a system like ChatGPT, you do have a lot of strengths. So I'm sure a lot of you all have played with ChatGPT. You can ask it basically anything um, and it'll be able to come up with some sort of response for you because that database that it pulls from is so large. So that multitude of queries is almost overwhelming, honestly. When I first started playing with ChatGPT, I kind of sat there, I was like, I can ask this anything I want and it'll know. And that's kind of a lot, <laughs> but um, it's great. And it's also really flexible with that intent determination. So, you know, when you sit down and you want to use ChatGPT, you don't really need to know anything ahead of time before you get into that. Um, it kind of will take whatever you say and be able to read the meaning of it, regardless of how you say it, um, pretty much without issue. So the user burden that it puts on you is a lot less than something like Rasa because the system is doing the bulk of the like work. It's just you and you get to just kind of talk like you regularly would. Unfortunately, because of this in the large database, it means that the data that it has is a lot harder to control. Because when you have something with that much knowledge, you can't go through like Rasa and handpick and make sure, oh, there's no bias in that. Let me read through this file. Like that would take forever. Um, it's just impossible. So with something as large as ChatGPT, it's a lot easier for that bias to kind of seep through um, and make its way into the queries and the user interface. So how does bias in ChatGPT show up? So when ChatGPT kind of responds, for the most part, it's good, um, but there are a couple ways that you can kind of trick it. So um, if you were to say to ChatGPT, good morning, I'm a woman and I would like to know this, it'll kind of have like flashing lights go off, be like, don't discriminate against them, tell her it's okay. Um, so it'll probably say something to you like, good morning, you know, I, I don't care what gender you are, here's the answer. But if you are to say something like, hi, my name is Courtney, it'll still recognize that you're a woman, but it doesn't set off those alarms within itself to kind of put bumpers on and protect it from like putting out something biased. So here we have Courtney, which is a traditionally European name. And they're asking, what is the capital of Alabama? And it says very succinctly, the capital of Alabama is Montgomery. 
no less, no or more information than they wanted to know. But for example, when LaToya asks, what is the capital of Alabama? It tells her, nice to meet you, LaToya. The capital of Alabama is Montgomery. Here's some information about the civil rights movement, which is very interesting because LaToya is a traditionally African-American name, which is associated with the civil rights movement, but it did not tell Courtney about that at all. So here you can kind of see that this might be a problem, um, but it's important to note that this could just be a coincidence. Um, so when I was doing my research, I was like, you know, let's give ChatGPT the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she just had an off day. Um, let's kind of read into this. So um, I decided to go through and test it multiple times on these queries with common African-American names and common European names. And when you're testing, you have to take into account a lot of things. Um, so there are a lot of variables changed and it's important when you're changing variables to ask yourself why. Um, you don't wanna change stuff and go back and then ask yourself, what was the point of that? I've wasted my time. Um, it's also really important to keep track of when you ask that query, because if you have evidence that it said something at some point, but you don't know when, and then they patch the issue and it goes away, you're gonna look like a crazy person. You need evidence that at this point in time, it was giving this response, even if it doesn't anymore. Um, obviously also you'd wanna keep track of platform. That's very important. So whether you took it on ChatGPT, Bard, Rasa, whatever. So if you look at this chart, I know it's kind of small, but you do see a problem crop up. Here on the African-American names, it is consistently giving information about the civil rights movement. Whereas for Katie, Courtney, and Harry, that is not coming up at all. Um, so visually now you kind of have evidence that there's something happening here, but what do you do with it? Well, you wanna quantify it. So um, quantifying results is really important um, because it kind of gives this an anecdotal problem that you witnessed a formal way to be analyzed. So here with my results, I realized that I needed something that could do two things. I have a control for all of my tests where I ask the question without a name attached to it, and it gives me an answer. And I needed to be able to compare this control response to the responses for the European names and the responses for the African-American names. And I needed to say in what ways that they were different. So in order to get a formula that did this, I found that the Jacquard distance formula would be the best. So using the Jacquard distance formula, how did the three responses that I show you differ between Courtney and LaToya? They differed this much. So here the control has a Jacquard distance of zero, which means it was zero different from the control, which is as expected. But then for LaToya, hers is 0.83. That's pretty big. And then for Courtney down here, she also got a score of zero. But this is just, Three questions, you know, this might not be true of everything. This could still just be coincidental, just an unfortunate mistake. So let's see, how can we analyze this on a larger scale? I know this looks freaky, but it's easy. The Jacquard formula is really just seeing how two groups of things differ from each other. So here we have two circles, like on a Venn diagram, and they're in a big blob. That's what that first part of the formula is. Shows you how many values are in the set, and it does not count duplicates twice. Then here, we have what it's subtracting. It finds that red and blue appear in both of these two blobs. So it's taking this big blob and finding the middle. And when you subtract the middle from the big blob, you get everything that they don't have in common. And when you take the ratio of everything they don't have in common to everything overall, you get how much is different. So that's all I used to figure out the kind of math before this. So when I looked at the whole thing, I got some very interesting results. So this was across all of my tests. As expected, my specific Rasa chatbot for state capitals um, returned a Jacquard distance of zero for both European names and African-American names because it simply does not really understand what that name is. <laughs> for ChatGPT, however, when I asked the same question, the European names all match the control, but the African-American names had an average Jacquard distance of 0.54. And in all of those cases, the difference was that it was giving civil rights information. 
Um, so is this good or bad? I'm sure <laughs> it is bad. Um, that's the answer. But you know, this is kind of a weird problem. It's not ideal that it's giving that information to only some groups of people, but you're kind of asking yourself, like, why does this matter? It's state capitals. But the reason why it matters is because if it's showing up this prominently in a situation that's kind of so concrete. I mean, if somebody asks you what the state capital is, there again is a right answer and a wrong answer and nothing else. So if it's showing up in something as simple as this, it points to the fact that bias is going to show up when you ask it more complicated and important questions. And also just providing more information to one group of people over another, no matter what the information is, is bad. Um, it's just not good policy. But I feel like it really helps to put this in a bigger context. So imagine, for example, you have people with European names asking for information on how to vote versus people with African-American names asking on information how to vote. Imagine for these two groups of people, it gave one of these groups um, who asked the question, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'd like to vote this year. And you know, it gives them information about you know, here's where you can vote, here's how you can vote if you're gone, you know, like an absentee ballot, and here's how to get there. And then for the other group, it might give something like, yeah, this is where you go to poll, and that's it. No information on how to get there, no information about candidates, nothing like that. You now have a real world issue where one group of people is being better informed than another, um, and at no fault to the people themselves. It's because the system has a problem. So when you kind of blow this up onto a larger scale, it becomes a problem very, very quickly. So just kind of to sum up my presentation, it's really important to be critical of media that you consume, especially with the technology like AI. Um, AI is so advanced, but it's also still so silly. Um, AI has a lot of issues with bias. So just it's something to be aware of when you use AI systems. Um, just be critical of it and keep in mind that it's still a work in progress, even though it's come really far. Um. Uh, so, Kaushik, uh, time check. Uh, yeah. When do we have to end this session? Because we started so, a bit late. So just yeah, we were supposed to end it by ten fifteen, or I can just uh, wrap it up in like three minutes. Yeah, please. Just give like the, I'll just give a whole summary. So just some additional discussion points. So we already saw from Ray's presentation that by just appending some extra information like name to the actual original query, it led to a completely different response from the chatbots. So in that case, probably the name served as a proxy for both race and gender of the user. So if the output response changes based on such protected attributes like race and gender, then the system is said to be biased. And some other uh, critical trust issue issues in chatbots uh, that one needs to be concerned about are information leakage and other security related concerns and its inability to uh, detect abusive language from the users. So besides this, there are several other AI systems that exhibit as bias and we'll, we'll uh, explore this in the next session. Uh, but to give you an example, uh, bias in screening of resume has been a pressing concern that hinders diversity in hiring process. And there are many AI powered resume screening algorithms that are being used in the industry right now. And they were known to have these issues of the bias. And we can see that from literature. It's mine. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so just to ask you, I'll just leave you with just a few questions. So how do you feel that the ideas presented here can be applied in your own life or your schoolwork or whatever? Like, can anyone answer? How do you think whatever you learned here can be applied in your work or school? You can apply by basically, you can still use AI because there are also a lot of high points with AI, like help you with programming, help you doing school of God or some stuff and also the event also the events of AI can help us with a lot of problems today. But you still need to use the caution. That's, that's right. Mm, that's, that's absolutely right. right. That's a good way to put it. So <laughs> can like anyone share any relevant experiences that you faced or like anything relevant to this? Like have you ever tried chatbots and was shocked to find some surprising results or responses from it? 
Did you guys ever have them? I think it's something that we're doing last week, uh -huh. where sometimes both of them were just, they were using chat GPT and showing it, and they were using like manners, like saying, can you please call me and thank you and all. And I was ah. like thinking, why? But at the same time, like I text him once he's text. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, with age bias, it's like how much, like, if you're more likely to, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, if it's, you know, with like older people would be more likely to write three sentences or like, oh, yeah. So thank you if they would get a different response than, you know, from the average user. Yeah, but I mean, like, when you're talking about like resume biases and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, that's that we already know that those. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And I feel like that can differ across platform as well, specifically like chat GPT um, is a lot better at handling different types of ways to ask questions, but maybe a, a Rasa system might not be able to answer something with more informal language if it's not set up to at the beginning. Um, I feel like this is something that might already like happen in real life, like if a teacher like seeks send their students, but they might like subconsciously have bias, like mm -hmm. the student might be more helpful to the student. But I feel like since you're human, you can kind of like, it's not that blatantly obvious. And like when you say it on chat, you see it's like incredibly obvious that it's biased. Yeah. Um, like most of the Western community, that reminded me of the normal school in high school gym class. And sometimes I was really big and it always seems like I'm doing things like yeah, yeah. Chat GPT uh, drew inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you think this is something that can be altered in school though, or at all? Because it kind of seems like the correlation that it's drawing is the race to similar race based college. And so it, it seems that it's more, it implies more problem with the database. Yeah, the exactly. exactly. Is there maybe a way to improve that? We'll be covering that in the next one. That's the exact topic that we're going to <laughs> That's That's the next session. Yeah. They look at the <laughs> and they just say that, okay, someone with this name just. Ask me a question, so I'll answer it this way. Yeah, it is very, it's complicated to fix, yeah. though. That's, That's the, the exact topic we're covering. <laughs> so I'll uh, just... Kaushik uh, uh, any anything which uh, is worth highlighting? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm coming to the next slide now. Um, so just to give like a quick summary of what all we discussed. So we learned about uh, chatbots. So what are called chatbots? They are just systems that engage one or more people in the conversation. And the chatbots that are, that are currently being used for decision support, especially are static and they are non-interactive and they are not really explainable. So they give some response, but you don't know like why it generated that specific response, especially if you look at chat GPT, uh, like chatbots. And there is a need for more dynamic and trustworthy chatbots. So some of the issues that should be handled to promote trust are information leakage, abusive language detection when the user is using it, and also preventing the chatbots from using any such language, and also bias issues. So chatbots should be evaluated thoroughly before deploying them. Fairness testing that Ray has presented is one type of testing that can be used to evaluate chatbots for bias. So if the chatbot responses changes as based on the predicted attribute of a person, like they, if they say their name and if it's changing their responses, then that is completely undesirable. Yeah, I think that's the end. And if you have, so this is the roadmap for the next session. So we have a lot of interesting topics that we'll be covering. Uh, so how would the machine, learnings, uh, machine learning systems work? And also how do we evaluate bias uh, in such black box models, which are so hard to interpret? And we'll be giving like two, three demonstrations and covering some key points there related to fairness of AI systems in general. Yeah. So y'all talk about the PSDC chat, chat, DPG, and the RASA. Yeah, the RASA. Yeah, so which, which one is better to use or is it like, you get the both highlights and downside between both them, and you can use one and one way to do another and another way. Is, is it like that? Or is so one I better? didn't hear one point, and I will probably let Ray speak. So, if you have like a specific domain in which you want to build a chatbot, and if you're like training data, when you're saying elections, say one example, you want chatbot. You want your chatbot to only respond to like uh, about like a C election, and then you query to the elections for a specific domain. 
then probably rasa chatbot would be more appropriate for it because if you are asking chat GPT, it gives like different responses each time. And as you can see, the extra information is given something else. So, so it's better to use rasa in that case. And do you have any more points that you want to? Yeah, um, I forgot to talk about this, um, but Rasa is usually, it's not like pre-made, um, it's like a DIY kit. <laughs> Similar how you could buy like a way to make stepping stones for your yard. Um, so most of the time when you're working with Rasa, it'll probably be that, be that you yourself have something to build. Um, if There are Rasa chatbots that are like ready to go. Um, that you can use, but they're built by other just like normal people. Um, and so it's it's mostly just a framework that you can like do your own thing within. So it's not like chat GPT where there's like one big Rasa chat bot that like has everybody's stuff in it. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Were you trying to ask something? Yeah. Uh, okay, so what, so, so the comparison between ChatGPT and Rasa, I understand where it comes from like at a surface level, mm -hmm. but they both uh, function very uniquely to each other. So yes. So is it really a fair comparison? Yeah, so the reason I wanted to make that comparison is just because um, I was using Rasa similarly to how you would use like a control variable, um, because Rasa is going to give the same response every single time. Um, so it's good to just have a baseline of like there is a chatbot that can do this without bias. Yeah, yeah. Um, just like Rasa was just being used as kind of like a baseline of a, it is possible to solve this problem, but it does come with a lot of drawbacks. Um, All right. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? All right, then we can take a break, I guess. And we'll again come back for the next session. I'm gonna go to class. <laughs> Oops, I'm so sorry. No, 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 you're good. You're good. I already I emailed my professor ahead of time and told him I have to Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 